and I printed off my sermon notes. So you can really see what's going on up here. I can wave in planes. All right. Matthew chapter 20 is where we're going to be at this morning. Matthew 20, 20 through 28. Right. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 20, we'll be looking at verses 20 through 28. Still people looking around, that's all right. Take your time. Matthew 20, verses 20 through 28. I'm happy to read this for you. Starting verse 20, it says... Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? he asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? We are able, they said to him. He told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. When the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them over and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray together once again. We have read your word, Heavenly Father. May your spirit guide me as I preach your word. And also convict our hearts to live out your word. We cherish it, we love it, and I pray, Father, that we are always proclaiming Christ, we are always making disciples, and that we are glorifying you. Like I said, be with me in my weakness. Any frailties that I have that might serve as a hindrance, let them be overshadowed by your goodness. Let the the greatness of this message, Lord, be what matters and not the messenger. We say these things in the name of our beloved King, Jesus. Amen. Now, do we have any Chick-fil-A fans in here? Hands went up really fast. Chick-fil-A is a very good place to go. And besides having delicious chicken sandwiches, what is Chick-fil-A usually known for? Right, okay. <laughs> I heard of them. All right. Usually when you think of Chick-fil-A, and I think I heard it from a few of you, usually you think of what? Customer service, don't you? Customer service. That they go out of their way to make all their customers feel special and will do a lot of things for them and go above and beyond. Now, have you kept up with what's happened at a local, not a local Chick-fil-A, but a Chick-fil-A on the news? Did you see where Chick-fil-A was in the news once again? Well, apparently... There was a man who approached a car in a Chick-fil-A drive through and attempted to carjack that car with the mother and child inside. Who saw that news story? Yeah, but what stopped it? Yeah, a Chick-fil-A employee came out and pretty much wrestled the man to the ground, saving the mother and child and holding the guy until the police got there. Now that is excellent service. I I wonder if he hovered over the guy after he whooped up on him and said, it's my pleasure. (laughs) I like to think that he did, right? And so when you again, when you think of Chick-fil-A, you think of excellent service, people willing to go above and beyond to help out someone. And in this case, you even see someone risking themselves in order to save one of their valued customers. Say what you want about Chick-fil-A, and I know Chick-fil-A gets a lot of slack, but you know if you go there, you will be treated well. You will receive excellent service. Now, what about us here? 
at First Baptist Church, is there service among ourselves? Are we willing to humble ourselves for the sake of each other? And are we willing to humble ourselves for the sake of serving our community? We've been going through our core values that I am at least proposing, hoping that the church will prayerfully adopt. We've already talked about G represents God, that God is the source of our growth. O is outreach. And now we're looking at S. And S is, as I've already said, is about serving, service or serve. And we look at this passage this morning and we see Jesus teaching us about suffering and service. And so there'll be two points to this sermon. Number one, service is about sacrifice. Service is about sacrifice. If you want to be a true servant of God and someone who actually is considerate of others and loves their brother and sister in Christ, there must be a sacrificial element involved. Secondly, service is about humiliation. Humiliation. And I don't mean humiliation like, ha ha, poking fun at you, but humbling yourself, that you have some humility about you. And so, like I said, we're continuing on through these proposed core values, going along with also the proposed vision to glorify God, make disciples, and take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the community and beyond. And this morning, I want to talk about serving people to Christ by modeling Christ. Serving people to Christ by modeling Christ. You know, a lot of times people become Christians in part because of the love of Christians. That a lot of people are so moved by Christian service, so moved by their sacrificial spirit, that they say to themselves, there is something to this Jesus. There is something to this faith, and we want to be a part of it. So again, we're talking about serving people to Christ by modeling Christ, looking at Jesus' example, and here again we see service is about sacrifice, and service is about humiliation. Now let's look at that first point, looking at verses 20 through 23 one more time. It reads, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want? He asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? We are able, they said to him. He told them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. So once again, service is about sacrifice. Now this mother, the mother of Zebedee's sons, and we know from elsewhere, it's talking about James and John. James and John are the sons of Zebedee, and they're also nicknamed the sons of thunder, and a lot of people suspect because they had a rambunctious spirit about them, they also were the ones who wanted to see the Samaritans burned up in hot fire. And so these guys were known for having ambition and aspiration. And so their mother comes along and approaches Jesus with a request for greatness. She wants something great for her sons. Now, when you read this account in the Gospel of Mark, the sons approach Jesus and ask Jesus the same thing. Now, who asked it? Well, there's no problem in saying that they collaborated together. That typically, what we see is that people will go and approach Jesus and ask point-blank questions. But what I theorize is that these guys wanted to use their sweet, dear old mother as leverage. Because it's hard to turn down mother's requests, right? And so they were hoping that she would pull on Jesus' heartstrings so that it would guarantee that they could get what they want. So out of reverence for Jesus, she kneels before him. And her desire is for her two sons to have positions of power. Jesus, when you enter in your kingdom, this future kingdom that you have been speaking of, when it is realized... Can my sons have positions on the right and to your left? 
Now, in that culture, to sit at someone's right hand means to be in a very valuable place of authority, to kind of be second banana. Actually, my, my son's name, Benjamin, is Hebrew for son of my right hand. And to be on the left, well, is also important. These are two important positions. And she says, I understand, Jesus, that you are great and there is no one greater, but can one of my sons, and I wondered if they decided among themselves who would be on the right and left, can one of them be in a position of power and the other one be in a position of power? Again, I think they're using their mom as leverage to guarantee what they want. So even though, now this is the interesting thing. This takes place immediately after verse 19. Let's look at verse 19 together. This is Jesus describing what is going to happen to him. He says, they will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised. Jesus was fully aware of what was going to happen to him in great detail. He didn't just believe that he was going to die. He knew the manner in which he was going to die. He was going to die by means of crucifixion. So in verse 19, he's talking about how he is going to suffer and die, and he's going to endure a brutal death by means of crucifixion. And out of that, somehow, these two brothers says, this is a great opportunity to talk about greatness. It doesn't really seem to make sense. They seem to be confused, and I've said this before, the disciples routinely were confused about things. That they hear about Jesus saying that he's going to suffer and die, and they're looking for a position of power and ease. So, both answer when Jesus asks them, are you going to be able to drink the cup that I drink from? Now, what does the cup symbolize? Well, in many times, it symbolizes wrath. That God in the Old Testament would say something to the example of, I will pour out my wrath, pour out my cup. A lot of times a cup means to suffer. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he agonized about what was going to happen to him. And he asked his father if his father could take this cup away from him. What is he talking about? Cups are often in reference to suffering and going through hardships. And Jesus was asking if there was a way to redeem humanity apart from me bearing this cup, let it be. But if there is not, I joyfully will do it to be obedient to you, Father. And so Jesus, again, is talking about this cup. And throughout the Bible, uh, i got a few examples. Psalm 75, 8 is an example. Isaiah 51, 17 through 18. You can ask me about those later. But those are examples in the Bible where the cup symbolizes suffering. And so to drink the cup of Christ, therefore, means to have a willingness to follow the path of Jesus, even if that entails suffering. And these guys coming before him, bold as brass, saying, give us positions of power. Jesus saying, well, I don't think you understand what you're asking for. See, Jesus is highly exalted through his suffering. Jesus was obedient to the Father on earth and died, and therefore he was highly exalted. And Jesus is asking the disciples, is that the path you want? You want greatness, But are you willing to go down a similar road I travel? Are you willing to suffer? Now, again, boat is brass, sons of thunder, right? You're like, sure, no problem, (laughs) right? Yeah, I can do it all the live long day, Jesus. I can do it with my eyes closed. Now, interestingly, Jesus doesn't reprimand them or say that y'all are stupid. In fact, he says this. What does he say to them? You will indeed drink my cup. And when we look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 12, verse 2, we see that James is killed for Jesus' sake. And when you read Revelation, you also learn that John, who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote the letters of John, who wrote the book of Revelation, the one desiring power in this passage, we see in the book of Revelation, he's forced into exile on the Isle of Patmos. And there he receives Revelation. And so they did indeed suffer. And now again, at this point, I don't think they realized what they were asking for. Jesus saw the irony of it, saying, yeah, you are going to get what you ask for. So James is martyred. 
and John is exiled, they drink their cup. And so here it is, the request for greatness can only be fulfilled by drinking a cup of humiliation. So when they come for this request for greatness, what you have to also realize is that you're also asking for a cup of humiliation. See, not only does Jesus drink the cup of humiliation, but his answer to the disciples shows that during his incarnation or his time here on earth, he's obedient to the Father. Here's what Blomberg writes, a New Testament scholar. He says, during his incarnation, the Son of God remained functionally subordinate to the Father despite their equality in essence. Let me stop right there because that sounds very technical. What does it mean that while Jesus was here on earth, he remained functionally subordinate to the Father despite their equality in essence? Basically, what it's saying is this, is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is equal to the Father. That they are of the same nature. But while he was here on earth, he didn't behave that way. Even though he is equal to the Father, while he was here on earth, he humbled himself to the Father. Okay? Now, let's use an earthly illustration. When I was growing up, And I don't know if it's still true. I don't keep up with boxing really that much. But when I was growing up, the greatest boxer at that time was Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson was a juggernaut. He was a beast, just a dangerous man all around. And so most people didn't last long in the ring with him because he was super strong, fast, and powerful. But I remember I was watching a video clip of Mike Tyson the other day and it showed a little child approaching him wanting to spar with him. That this little, I think it was a little boy, went up to Mike Tyson and was going like that. At Mike, and so Mike Tyson does the same thing. He gets down and he starts going like that at the child and the child just sits there and hits him across the chin and Mike Tyson goes down. Now here's the thing. Does anyone actually believe that Mike Tyson lacked power in that scenario? Of course not. That child had no ability in of himself to take Mike Tyson out. However, for the sake of fun and a little bit of humor, Mike Tyson in that situation humbled himself and allowed the child to knock him out. And so that's what Jesus Christ did when he came here on earth. He humbled himself. His nature did not change. His powers or ability did not change. He just didn't act it on him. He humbled himself so he can demonstrate what true servanthood looks like. And to demonstrate what it truly means to be obedient to the Father. What did Jesus say when he was arrested and Peter cut off the ear of Malchus? He said, don't you know I can call down legions of angels? It's not for a lack of power, uh, Peter. It's because it's according to God's plan that they are arresting me. And I'm humbling myself to that. So back to the quote, during his incarnation, the Son of God remained functionally subordinate to the Father despite their equality in essence. All authority will be delegated to Christ after his resurrection, but for now, when we look at Jesus' ministry, Jesus has voluntarily relinquished some of that authority. He humbled himself and became a servant. And so service is about humiliation, humbling yourself. And Jesus modeled that for us. Service is about sacrifice. Jesus will elaborate a little bit more about sacrificial ministry. But for now, we are to understand that greatness is partly about suffering for the kingdom. If you want to be a true servant of God, if we want to be a church that truly is serving among ourselves, serving our fellow man, loving on our man, there's going to require a little bit of risk. There's going to require a little bit of sacrifice. And in some cases, and we talked about this before from the pulpit and other parts of the world, we see that sacrifice can be very severe. 
But we are to present ourselves. In Romans 12, 1, that's what it says. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. One of the differences between Old Testament sacrifices and New Testament sacrifice, when an Old Testament sacrifice it was used, it was used and it was done. It was over with. But we are not deceased sacrifices, one and done. But rather we are living sacrifices that are to be used over and over again. That our life is in of itself a sacrifice to the service of God and the service of others. So again, service is about sacrifice. If we want to be a church, we have to keep that in mind. Now I want you to think about something. Most of the things that you love in your life required sacrificial risk. Did you know that? Most of the things in your life required sacrificial risk. When you decided to marry someone, there was an inherent risk involved. You're placing your faith and trust in a lot of person. You're hoping that they don't eventually burn you. That you are giving up a little bit and you also are sacrificing self-autonomy because once you go into marriage, it's no longer just about you, it's about someone else now. But you do it nonetheless. Why? Because you love it. The same way with kids. You sacrifice a great deal for kids. If you're a woman, you sacrifice a great deal physically to have children. You endure a great deal of pain. And the husbands are over there, they're, they're having just as hard a time as you are. Right? That's a joke. All right? But there is a degree of sacrifice to have children. Again, not only is it no longer about just you and your spouse, but now it's about these little people who eat up your income, who eat up your pantry, who seem to always be there. <laughs> Bless her heart. They're sacrifice, but you love it, don't you? You love your marriage, you love your kids. Same with jobs, require a little bit of sacrifice. High education requires sacrifice. If you want to be well informed, well educated, you got to sacrifice time and energy to do the work. Same with just being healthy all around. You know, I, I'm shocked and amazed that I don't lose weight when I'm just sitting around on the couch eating chips. That requires very little sacrifice. There is no risk to it. Nature itself teaches us that growth occurs within difficulty. Just by sheer observation, you see a seed persevere and break through the soil and reach the top so that it may grow. Even when we have children being born, the agony and the difficulty just to introduce another human being in life. It just seems to be a part of our makeup. It's as if God designed it that way. Shocker, right? That we see just lesson after lesson. That if you want to endure, if you want to strive, you must understand that sacrifice is also a part of things about growing in the Lord. And service is the same way. See, anytime we want to serve someone else, and it's someone we don't like, and you might be sitting there thinking, are we called to do that? Well, yeah, Jesus said that. If you only love those who love you, what reward is there in that? And so when you decide to love someone that you deem unlovable, that requires sacrifice. And also, if you're a church who finally decides to engage the community, there's going to be sacrifice there as well. And people always make up excuses. They always point out the risk as to why not to serve the community. Oh, if you give them this, they'll only waste it over air on that. Hear it all the time. If you give them this money, they'll use it in a bad way. Well, there's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the risk. Yeah. And? See, Church isn't about internal and safe. Sometimes it is. But it also there's an element of external and risk. Sacrifice. Even when we look at the incarnation of Jesus, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave, Jesus left his realm to enter ours, to serve us and to love us. Jumping ahead a little bit. But you're getting my point. If you truly want to be a serving church, it always will entail risk. It will always entail sacrifice. And you'll always, if you're not careful, let the excuses win the day. 
And the excuses will sound noble, they'll make sense to you, and then you'll find yourself doing nothing, convincing yourself that doing nothing is actually better than doing something. I see it all the time. We got to be careful. Jesus made it clear that to follow him, to serve him, there will be suffering. James and John suffered in their own way. Now let's talk about how service is about humility. Let's go back and look at the rest of the passage, 24 through 28. When the ten disciples heard this, they became indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them over and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, who wants, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Service is about humility. Somehow the rest of the disciples heard about the request of the brothers. They were not happy about it. Now why were they unhappy about it? I don't know. But I strongly suspect they were unhappy about it because they failed to ask first. That James and John beat them to the punch. And so they got angry with them, got indignant with them. And what Jesus does is he uses us as an opportunity to teach them about greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Now, everyone understands the hierarchical layout and operations of government. This is not Jesus bad-mouthing the existence of government. He's just sitting here saying the way that they conduct themselves is going to be radically different than you are to conduct yourselves. There is someone in a position of authority and people live to serve this person. That's how we usually think of hierarchy, especially in their day. There's a king and then there's servants who serve the king. Jesus, however, introduces what has been called an upside-down kingdom in that things are a little bit different. They're not exactly the way that we would expect. Those who wish to be great in this kingdom should not aspire to be rulers, but servants and slaves. Diakonos and doulos is the Greek words there, and diakonos is where we get the word deacon. Jesus came not to be deaconed, but to deacon. I preached on that about a year ago. So he introduces this upside down kingdom. Servants and slaves is what you're to aspire to be like. And to make it even worse, if you couple that with what Jesus said about children. See, in that culture, when he talks about how you must be like children, a lot of times people think slaves are at the bottom. Slaves are not at the bottom. In fact, slaves were often assigned to children to oversee them and have authority over them. So it's not that slaves are at the bottom. Children are at the bottom. And Jesus says that you must become like a child. He's not saying be humble like a child. I've never met a humble child before. But he's talking about adopting the position of a child. And the hierarchical ladder, you are to be at the bottom. France remarks, commentator France, he says, the point is that the values of secular society do not apply among you. Authority and greatness among the disciples of Jesus are reverse of what the world is used to. True greatness is in service. In this, as in the other areas of human values, Jesus has turned the world upside down. You want to be great, don't desire the best position at the table. If you want to be great, don't demand that you are recognized by your position when you're walking out in public. If you want to be great, don't even be neutral. In fact, go out of your way to be the lowest. You must humble yourself. You must humble yourself in order to be great. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. 1 Timothy 4.12 This is a, a verse I come back to. And I've had adopted this verse many years ago. I entered into the ministry formally when I was about, I believe, 24. I am 40 now. And so I became, I was a youth minister at 24 and eventually became pastor at 27. Young, right? So 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul writing to a very young pastor, he says this, Don't let anyone despise your youth. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And so what I did from that verse 
is I adopted that to myself. Because I knew that I was young. Now a lot of times, young people, and, and this is just advice for any young people inside the church. Young people often point to this verse and say, Aha! You're not supposed to despise me because of my youth. That they insist on respect. And, and I, th- I see a lot of young pastors do the same thing. Well, I'm a pastor. I have X amount of degrees. I therefore should have some type of respect. That's not what Paul instructs Timothy to do. He says it's going to be inevitable that people are going to look down on you because you're young. It can't be helped. Now, what does he tell Timothy do to counteract that? And again, this is good advice to tell your children, grandchildren, your children who are in this room. If you want to have respect and not let your youth get in the way, set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. In other words, counteract their prejudice with good works and servanthood. It's hard to be angry at the person who's serving, isn't it? It's hard to lack respect for someone who is busting their hump. And that's what Paul is telling Timothy. That don't let them have any type of solid objection against you, but rather counteract their prejudices with good works and servanthood. And listen, that's not just good advice for young people. That's just good advice in general. I see it all the time that people inside churches insist on having their way. Demand having their way. Appeal to their position to have their way. Use manipulation to get their way. And here's the thing. You can get your way that way. You can. There's, you can manipulate things and get what you want. But that's not how it ought to be in the kingdom. That's what politicians do. Right? That's what corrupt, should I say, corrupt politicians do. But we're not supposed to be like that. We're not supposed to lord over each other. We are to serve one another. This is the upside down kingdom. And here's this. Jesus exemplifies this as the upside down king. Jesus drank the cup of humiliation and lowered himself during the incarnation and there is more. Jesus entered the world to serve and not be served. His ultimate sacrifice was to give his life as a ransom for many. See, one of the greatest Old Testament passages about Jesus is the passage where he's called the suffering servant. Found in Isaiah 52 into Isaiah 53. That I often tell my friends who are Jewish, who have not redempted Christ as Savior, that they need to go read that passage, and I don't see how they cannot recognize Jesus in that passage. But he's described as the suffering servant. One of the greatest messianic passages in the Old Testament, the Son of God is referred to as the suffering servant. Both things that I'm talking about today. Suffering and serving. And this is what it says in part in Isaiah 53, 4 through 5. Very lengthy passage, but I'll just hit this. It says, yet he himself bore our sicknesses and he carried away our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. That's the ministry of the suffering servants. And I want you to understand this, this phrase that he gave his life as a ransom for many. It's tricky because it's not found anywhere else in the New Testament. But most people agree this idea of ransoming someone is someone who found themselves in slavery. And in that the master, a greater kinsman redeemer sometimes, but some type of redeemer would come along and free them from their slavery. Now I don't want you to think about the death of Jesus Christ in monetary terms that he bought your salvation and it cost five billion dollars. But think about it in legal terms. In that legally, you were enslaved to sin. Legally, you deserve to die for your sin. Legally, it is you that should have suffered for your sins. But Jesus in his humiliation and his 
servanthood took your place. I, mean, I want you to think about this. This is the gospel. Where would the gospel be if there was no element of service? See, I, I'm not talking about becoming a church that just does nice things for people like any other charity out there. There's tons of organizations and nonprofits that do nice things for people. And it's great. That's wonderful. But I, I think that churches fail to see the theology behind servanthood. That they say, yeah, we're supposed to be nice. Oh, it's not just that. We're also modeling for the world what the gospel looks like when it's lived out. It's one thing to preach the gospel. It's another thing to practice the gospel. Churches are often good about preaching the gospel, but when it comes to practicing it, modeling it, to see a church that's willing to humble themselves. And again, it's going to require sacrifice. Sacrifice. You know, I'll give you an example of a church that really took us seriously. I can't remember this. But this local church just simply emptied out the local orphanage. Emptied it out. Adopt every child that was in there. Now that requires a lot of sacrifice. It's hard to do, isn't it? But think about that. I've thought about this before. And it convicts me too. Now, a lot of times churches are sitting there scratching their heads. Well, I'd love to see our numbers increase. You know a quick way to do that? Adopt. Think about that. If every abled family did that at First Baptist Church, it's hard. It's sacrificial. Chasing a rabbit, though. My brother's adopted. And it was joy to watch him come from a hard family. They found him eating out of a dumpster at a Burger King and took him into our family. And he's my brother. This is, this is what it means to go out and serve. That it's not always easy, comfortable, neat, cookie-cutter, package type event. But often it means really opening up your lives and risking things so that you can see the gospel prevail. Jesus did it. He gave his life a ransom for many. And so this is what kind of church I want us to go in the direction of. Right now, most churches, it's not just us, we like our internal, safe ministry and avoid the external risky ministry and we'll make up excuses why we don't do the external and risky and we'll convince ourselves it's actually noble more virtuous not to do that but we need to model the gospel with our preaching and our practice our friends are going to help us out this is a, a time, a prayer to reflect on what was preached or to respond to the gospel that Jesus did indeed die for you in your place when you deserved to suffer, deserved to go to hell. Jesus endured hell for you on the cross so that you can have eternal life. The grave could not hold him he defeated it. He's the master of life and death and he can give it to whomever he pleases and he wants to give it to people who faithfully love him.